Part three of Theaetetus by Plato, translated by Benjamin Joet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards. Socrates. In the first place, let us return to our old objection and see whether we were right in blaming and taking offence at Protagoras on the ground that he assumed all to be equal and sufficient in wisdom, although he admitted that there was a better and worse, and that in respect of this some who, as he said, were the wise, excelled others. Theodorus. Very true. Socrates. Had Protagoras been living and answered for himself, instead of our answering for him, there would have been no need of our reviewing or reinforcing the argument. But, as he is not here, and some one may accuse us of speaking without authority on his behalf, had we not better come to a clearer agreement about his meaning? For a great deal may be at stake. Theodorus. True. Socrates. Then, let us obtain, not through any third person, but from his own statement, and in the fewest words possible, the basis of agreement. Theodorus. In what way? Socrates. In this way. His words are, What seems to a man is to him. Theodorus. Yes, so he says. Socrates. And are not we, Protagoras, uttering the opinion of man, or rather, of all mankind, when we say that every one thinks himself wiser than other men in some things, and their inferior in others. In the hour of danger, when they are in perils of war, or of the sea, or of sickness, do they not look up to their commanders as if they were gods, and expect salvation from them, only because they excel them in knowledge? Is not the world full of men in their several employments who are looking for teachers and rulers of themselves and of the animals? And there are plenty who think that they are able to teach and able to rule. Now in all this is implied that ignorance and wisdom exist among them, at least in their own opinion. Theodorus. Certainly. Socrates. And wisdom is assumed by them to be true thought and ignorance to be false opinion? Theodorus, exactly. Socrates, how then, Protagoras, would you have us treat the argument? Shall we say that the opinions of men are always true, or sometimes true and sometimes false? In either case the result is the same, and their opinions are not always true, but sometimes true and sometimes false. For tell me, Theodorus, do you suppose that you yourself, or any other follower of Protagoras would contend that no one deems another ignorant or mistaken in his opinion? Theodorus. The thing is incredible, Socrates. Socrates. And yet, that absurdity is necessarily involved in the thesis which declares man to be the measure of all things. Theodorus. How so? Socrates. Why, suppose that you determine in your own mind something to be true, and declare your opinion to me. Let us assume, as he argues, that this is true to you. Now, if so, you must either say that the rest of us are not the judges of this opinion or judgment of yours, or that we judge you always to have a true opinion. But are there not thousands upon thousands who, whenever you form a judgment, take up arms against you, and are of an opposite judgment and opinion, deeming that you judge falsely? Theodorus. Yes, indeed, Socrates thousands and tens of thousands as homer says who give me a world of trouble socrates well but are we to assert that what you think is true to you and false to the ten thousand others theodorus no other inference seems to be possible socrates and how about protagoras himself if neither he nor the multitude thought as indeed they do not think that man is the measure of all things must it not follow that the truth of which Protagoras wrote would be true to no one? But if you suppose that he himself thought this, and that the multitude does not agree with him, you must begin by allowing that in whatever proportion the many are more than one, in that proportion his truth is more untrue than true. Theodorus. That would follow if the truth is supposed to vary with individual opinion. Socrates. 
and the best of the joke is that he acknowledges the truth of their opinion who believe his own opinion to be false for he admits that the opinions of all men are true theodorus certainly socrates and does he not allow that his own opinion is false if he admits that the opinion of those who think him false is true theodorus of course socrates whereas the other side do not admit that they speak falsely theodorus they do not socrates and he as may be inferred from his writings agrees that this opinion is also true theodorus clearly socrates then all mankind beginning with protagoras will contend or rather i should say that he will allow when he concedes that his adversary has a true opinion protagoras i say will himself allow that neither a dog nor any ordinary man is the measure of anything which he has not learned am i not right theodorus yes socrates and the truth of protagoras being doubted by all will be true neither to himself nor to any one else theodorus i think socrates that we are running my old friend too hard socrates but i do not know that we are going beyond the truth doubtless as he is older he may be expected to be wiser than we are and if he could only just get his head out of the world below he would have overthrown both of us again and again me for talking nonsense and you for assenting to me and have been off and underground in a trice but as he is not within call we must make the best use of our own faculties such as they are and speak out what appears to us to be true and one thing which no one will deny is that there are great differences in the understandings of men theodorus in that opinion i quite agree socrates and is there not most likely to be firm ground in the distinction which we were indicating on behalf of protagoras viz that most things and all immediate sensations such as hot dry sweet are only such as they appear if however difference of opinion is to be allowed at all surely we must allow it in respect of health or disease for every woman child or living creature has not such a knowledge of what conduces to health as to enable them to cure themselves theodorus i quite agree socrates or again in politics while affirming that just and unjust honourable and disgraceful holy and unholy are in reality to each state such as the state thinks and makes lawful and that in determining these matters no individual or state is wiser than another still the followers of protagoras will not deny that in determining what is or is not expedient for the community one state is wiser and one counsellor better than another they will scarcely venture to maintain that what a city enacts in the belief that it is expedient will always be really expedient but in the other case i mean when they speak of justice and injustice piety and impiety they are confident that in nature these have no existence or essence of their own the truth is that which is agreed on at the time of the agreement and as long as the agreement lasts and this is the philosophy of many who do not altogether go along with protagoras here arises a new question theodorus which threatens to be more serious than the last theodorus well socrates we have plenty of leisure socrates that is true and your remark recalls to my mind an observation which i have often made that those who have passed their days in the pursuit of philosophy are ridiculously at fault when they have to appear and speak in court how natural is this theodorus what do you mean socrates i mean to say that those who have been trained in philosophy and liberal pursuits are as unlike those who from their youth upwards have been knocking about in the courts in such places as a free man is in breeding unlike a slave theodorus in what is the difference seen socrates in the leisure spoken of by you which a free man can always command he has his talk out in peace and like ourselves he wanders at will from one subject to another and from a second to a third if the fancy takes him he begins again as we are doing now caring not whether his words are many or few his only aim is to attain the truth but the lawyer is always in a hurry there is the water of the clepsydra driving him on 
in not allowing him to expatiate at will and there is his adversary standing over him enforcing his rights the indictment which in their phraseology is termed the affidavit is recited at the time and from this he must not deviate he is a servant and is continually disputing about a fellow-servant before his master who is seated and has the cause in his hands the trial is never about some indifferent matter but always concerns himself and often the race is for his life the consequence has been that he has become keen and shrewd he has learned how to flatter his master in word and indulge him in deed but his soul is small and unrighteous his condition which has been that of a slave from his youth upwards has deprived him of growth and uprightness and independence dangers and fears which were too much for his truth and honesty came upon him in early years when the tenderness of youth was unequal to them and he has been driven into crooked ways from the first he has practised deception and retaliation and has become stunted and warped and so he has passed out of youth into manhood having no soundness in him and is now as he thinks a master in wisdom such is the lawyer theodorus will you have the companion picture of the philosopher who is of our brotherhood or shall we return to the argument do not let us abuse the freedom of digression which we claim theodorus nay socrates not until we have finished what we are about for you truly said that we belong to a brotherhood which is free and are not the servants of the argument but the argument is our servant and must wait our leisure who is our judge or where is the spectator having any right to censure or control us as he might the poets socrates then as this is your wish i will describe the leaders for there is no use in talking about the inferior sort in the first place the lords of philosophy have never from their youth upwards known their way to the agora or the dicastery or the council or any other political assembly they neither see nor hear the laws or decrees as they are called of the state written or recited the eagerness of political societies in the attainment of offices clubs and banquets and revels and singing maidens do not enter even into their dreams whether any event has turned out well or ill in the city what disgrace may have descended to any one from his ancestors male or female are matters of which the philosopher no more knows than he can tell as they say how many pints are contained in the ocean neither is he conscious of his ignorance for he does not hold aloof in order that he may gain a reputation but the truth is that the outer form of him only is in the city his mind disdaining the littlenesses and nothingnesses of human things is flying all abroad as pindar says measuring earth and heaven and the things which are under and on the earth and above the heaven interrogating the whole nature of each and all in their entirety but not condescending to anything which is within reach theodorus what do you mean socrates socrates i will illustrate my meaning theodorus by the jest which the clever witty thracian handmaid is said to have made about thales when he fell into a well as he was looking up at the stars she said that he was so eager to know what was going on in heaven that he could not see what was before his feet this is a jest which is equally applicable to all philosophers for the philosopher is wholly unacquainted with his next-door neighbour he is ignorant not only of what he is doing but he hardly knows whether he is a man or an animal he is searching into the essence of man and busy in inquiring what belongs to such a nature to do or suffer different from any other i think that you understand me theodorus theodorus i do and what you say is true socrates and thus my friend on every occasion private as well as public as i said at first when he appears in a law court or in any place in which he has to speak of things which are at his feet and before his eyes he is the jest not only of thracian handmaids but of the general herd tumbling into wells and every sort of disaster through his inexperience his awkwardness is fearful and gives the impression of imbecility when he is reviled he has nothing personal to say in answer to the civilities of his adversaries for he knows no scandals of any one and they do not interest him 
and therefore he is laughed at for his sheepishness and when others are being praised and glorified in the simplicity of his heart he cannot help going into fits of laughter so that he seems to be a downright idiot when he hears a tyrant or king eulogized he fancies that he is listening to the praises of some keeper of cattle a swineherd or shepherd or perhaps a cowherd who is congratulated on the quantity of milk which he squeezes from them and he remarks that the creature whom they tend and out of whom they squeeze the wealth is of a less tractable and more insidious nature then again he observes that the great man is of necessity as ill-mannered and uneducated as any shepherd for he has no leisure and he is surrounded by a wall which is his mountain pen hearing of enormous landed proprietors of ten thousand acres and more our philosopher deems this to be a trifle because he has been accustomed to think of the whole earth and when they sing the praises of family and say that some one is a gentleman because he can show seven generations of wealthy ancestors he thinks that their sentiments only betray a dull and narrow vision in those who utter them and who are not educated enough to look at the whole nor to consider that every man has had thousands and ten thousands of progenitors and among them have been rich and poor kings and slaves hellenes and barbarians innumerable and when people pride themselves on having a pedigree of twenty-five ancestors which goes back to heracles the son of amphitryon he cannot understand their poverty of ideas why are they unable to calculate that amphitryon had a twenty-fifth ancestor who might have been anybody and was such as fortune made him and he had a fiftieth and so on he amuses himself with the notion that they cannot count and thinks that a little arithmetic would have got rid of their senseless vanity now in all these cases our philosopher is derided by the vulgar partly because he is thought to despise them and also because he is ignorant of what is before him and always at a loss theodorus that is very true socrates socrates but o oh my friend when he draws the other into upper air and gets him out of his pleas and rejoinders into the contemplation of justice and injustice in their own nature and in their difference from one another and from all other things or from the commonplaces about the happiness of a king or of a rich man to the consideration of government and of human happiness and misery in general what they are and how a man is to attain the one and avoid the other when that narrow keen little legal mind is called to account about all this he gives the philosopher his revenge for dizzied by the height at which he is hanging whence he looks down into space which is a strange experience to him he being dismayed and lost and stammering broken words is laughed at not by thracian handmaidens or any other uneducated persons for they have no eye for the situation but by every man who has not been brought up a slave such are the two characters theodorus the one of the free man who has been trained in liberty and leisure whom you call the philosopher him we cannot blame because he appears simple and of no account when he has to perform some menial task such as packing up bedclothes or flavouring a sauce or fawning speech the other character is that of the man who is able to do all this kind of service smartly and neatly but knows not how to wear his cloak like a gentleman still less with the music of discourse can he hymn the true life aright which is lived by immortals or men blessed of heaven theodorus if you could only persuade everybody socrates as you do me of the truth of your words there would be more peace and fewer evils among men socrates evils theodorus can never pass away for there must always remain something which is antagonistic to good having no place among the gods in heaven of necessity they hover around the mortal nature and this earthly sphere wherefore we ought to fly away from earth to heaven as quickly as we can and to fly away is to become like god as far as this is possible and to become like him is to become holy just and wise but o oh my friend you cannot easily convince mankind that they should pursue virtue or avoid vice not merely in order that a man may seem to be good which is the reason given by the world and in my judgment is only a repetition of an old wives fable 
whereas the truth is that God is never in any way unrighteous. He is perfect righteousness, and he of us who is the most righteous is most like him. Herein is seen the true cleverness of a man, and also his nothingness and want of manhood. For to know this is true wisdom and virtue, and ignorance of this is manifest folly and vice. All other kinds of wisdom or cleverness, which seem only, such as the wisdom of politicians, or the wisdom of the arts, are coarse and vulgar. The unrighteous man, or the sayer and doer of unholy things, had far better not be encouraged in the illusion that his roguery is clever. For men glory in their shame. They fancy that they hear others saying of them, These are not mere good-for-nothing persons, mere burdens of the earth, but such as men should be who mean to dwell safely in a state. Let us tell them that they are all the more truly what they do not think they are, because they do not know it, for they do not know the penalty of injustice, which above all things they ought to know. Not stripes and death, as they suppose, which evildoers often escape, but a penalty which cannot be escaped. Theodorus, what is that? Socrates, there are two patterns eternally set before them, the one blessed and divine, the other godless and wretched, but they do not see them, or perceive that in their utter folly and infatuation they are growing like the one and unlike the other, by reason of their evil deeds, and the penalty is that they lead a life answering to the pattern which they are growing like, and if we tell them that unless they depart from their cunning the place of innocence will not receive them after death, and that here on earth they will live ever in the likeness of their own evil selves, and with evil friends. When they hear this, they, in their superior cunning, will seem to be listening to the talk of idiots. Theodorus. Very true, Socrates. Socrates. Too true, my friend. As I well know, there is, however, one peculiarity in their case, when they begin to reason in private about their dislike of philosophy if they have the courage to hear the argument out, and do not run away, they grow at last strangely discontented with themselves. The rhetoric fades away, and they become helpless as children. These, however, are digressions from which we must now desist, or they will overflow, and drown the original argument, to which, if you please, we will now return. Theodorus. For my part, Socrates, I would rather have the digressions, for at my age I find them easier to follow. But, if you wish, let us go back to the argument. Socrates. Had we not reached the point at which the partisans of the perpetual flux, who say that things are as they seem to each one, were confidently maintaining that the ordinances which the state commanded and thought just, were just to the state which imposed them, while they were in force. This was especially asserted of justice. But, as to the good, no one had any longer the hardihood to contend of any ordinances which the state thought and enacted to be good that these, while they were in force, were really good. He who said so would be playing with the name good, and would not touch the real question. It would be a mockery, would it not? Theodorus. Certainly it would. Socrates. He ought not to speak of the name, but of the thing which is contemplated under the name? Theodorus. Right. Socrates. Whatever be the term used, the good or expedient is the aim of legislation, and, as far as she has an opinion, the state imposes all laws with a view to the greatest expediency. Can legislation have any other aim? Theodorus. Certainly not. Socrates. But is the aim attained always? Do not mistakes often happen? Theodorus. Yes, I think that there are mistakes. Socrates. The possibility of error will be more distinctly recognized if we put the question in reference to the whole class under which the good or expedient falls. That whole class has to do with the future, and laws are passed under the idea that they will be useful in after time, which, in other words, is the future. Theodorus. Very true. Socrates. Suppose now that we ask Protagoras, or one of his disciples, a question. O Protagoras, we will say to him, man is, as you declare, the measure of all things, white, heavy, light. Of all such things he is the judge, for he has the criterion of them in himself. 
and when he thinks that things are such as he experiences them to be he thinks what is and is true to himself is it not so theodorus yes socrates and do you extend your doctrine protagoras as we shall further say to the future as well as to the present and has he the criterion not only of what in his opinion is but of what will be and do things always happen to him as he expected for example take the case of heat when an ordinary man thinks that he is going to have a fever and that this kind of heat is coming on and another person who is a physician thinks the contrary whose opinion is likely to prove right or are they both right he will have a heat and fever in his own judgment and not have a fever in the physician's judgment theodorus how ludicrous socrates and the vine-grower if i am not mistaken is a better judge of the sweetness or dryness of the vintage which is not yet gathered than the harp-player theodorus certainly socrates and in musical composition the musician will know better than the training-master what the training-master himself will hereafter think harmonious or the reverse theodorus of course socrates and the cook will be a better judge than the guest who is not a cook of the pleasure to be derived from the dinner which is in preparation for of present or past pleasure we are not as yet arguing but can we say that every one will be to himself the best judge of the pleasure which will seem to be and will be to him in the future nay would not you protagoras better guess which arguments in a court would convince any one of us than the ordinary man theodorus certainly socrates he used to profess in the strongest manner that he was the superior of all men in this respect socrates to be sure friend who would have paid a large sum for the privilege of talking to him if he had really persuaded his visitors that neither a prophet nor any other man was better able to judge what will be and seem to be in the future than every one could for himself theodorus who indeed socrates and legislation and expediency are all concerned with the future and every one will admit that states in passing laws must often fail of their highest interests theodorus quite true socrates then we may fairly argue against your master that he must admit one man to be wiser than another and that the wiser is a measure but i who know nothing am not at all obliged to accept the honour which the advocate of protagoras was just now forcing upon me whether i would or not of being a measure of anything theodorus that is the best refutation of him socrates although he is also caught when he ascribes truth to the opinions of others who give the lie direct to his own opinion socrates there are many ways theodorus in which the doctrine that every opinion of every man is true may be refuted but there is more difficulty in proving that states of feeling which are present to a man and out of which arise sensations and opinions in accordance with them are also untrue and very likely i have been talking nonsense about them for they may be unassailable and those who say that there is clear evidence of them and that they are matters of knowledge may probably be right in which case our friend theaetetus was not so far from the mark when he identified perception and knowledge and therefore let us draw nearer as the advocate of protagoras desires and give the truth of the universal flux a ring is the theory sound or not at any rate no small war is raging about it and there are combatants not a few theodorus no small war indeed for in ionia the sect makes rapid strides the disciples of heraclitus are most energetic upholders of the doctrine socrates then we are the more bound my dear theodorus to examine the question from the foundation as it is set forth by themselves theodorus certainly we are about these speculations of heraclitus which as you say are as old as homer or even older still the ephesians themselves who profess to know them are downright mad and you cannot talk with them on the subject for in accordance with their text-books they are always in motion but as for dwelling upon an argument or a question and quietly asking and answering in turn they can no more do so than they can fly 
or rather the determination of these fellows not to have a particle of rest in them is more than the utmost powers of negation can express if you ask any of them a question he will produce as from a quiver sayings brief and dark and shoot them at you and if you inquire the reason of what he has said you will be hit by some other new-fangled word and will make no way with any of them nor they with one another their great care is not to allow of any settled principle either in their arguments or in their minds conceiving as i imagine that any such principle would be stationary for they are at war with the stationary and do what they can to drive it out everywhere socrates i suppose theodorus that you have only seen them when they were fighting and have never stayed with them in time of peace for they are no friends of yours and their peace doctrines are only communicated by them at leisure as i imagine to those disciples of theirs whom they want to make like themselves theodorus disciples my good sir they have none men of their sort are not one another's disciples but they grow up at their own sweet will and get their inspiration anywhere each of them saying of his neighbour that he knows nothing from these men then as i was going to remark you will never get a reason whether with their will or without their will we must take the question out of their hands and make the analysis ourselves as if we were doing a geometrical problem socrates quite right too but as touching the aforesaid problem have we not heard from the ancients who concealed their wisdom from the many in poetical figures that Oceanus and Tethys, the origin of all things, are streams, and that nothing is at rest? And now the moderns, in their superior wisdom, have declared the same openly, that the cobbler too may hear and learn of them, and no longer foolishly imagine that some things are at rest and others in motion. Having learned that all is motion, he will duly honour his teachers. I had almost forgotten the opposite doctrine, Theodorus. Alone, being remains unmoved which is the name for the all this is the language of parmenides melissos and their followers who stoutly maintain that all being is one and self-contained and has no place in which to move what shall we do friend with all these people for advancing step by step we have imperceptibly got between the combatants and unless we can protect our retreat we shall pay the penalty of our rashness like the players in the palestra who are caught upon the line and are dragged different ways by the two parties therefore i think that we had better begin by considering those whom we first accosted the river gods and if we find any truth in them we will help them to pull us over and try to get away from the others but if the partisans of the whole appear to speak more truly we will fly off from the party which would move the immovable to them and if we find that neither of them have anything reasonable to say we shall be in a ridiculous position having so great a conceit of our own poor opinion and rejecting that of ancient and famous men o oh, theodorus do you think that there is any use in proceeding when the danger is so great theodorus nay socrates not to examine thoroughly what the two parties have to say would be quite intolerable socrates then examine we must since you who were so reluctant to begin are so eager to proceed the nature of motion appears to be the question with which we begin what do they mean when they say that all things are in motion is there only one kind of motion or as i rather incline to think two i should like to have your opinion upon this point in addition to my own that i may err if i must err in your company tell me then when a thing changes from one place to another or goes round in the same place is not that what is called motion theodorus yes socrates here then we have one kind of motion but when a thing remaining on the same spot grows old or becomes black from being white or hard from being soft or undergoes any other change may not this be properly called motion of another kind theodorus i think so socrates say rather that it must be so of motion then there are these two kinds change and motion in place theodorus you are right socrates and now having made this distinction 
let us address ourselves to those who say that all is motion and ask them whether all things according to them have the two kinds of motion and are changed as well as move in place or is one thing moved in both ways and another in one only theodorus indeed i do not know what to answer but i think they would say that all things are moved in both ways socrates yes comrade for if not they would have to say that the same things are in motion and at rest and there would be no more truth in saying that all things are in motion than that all things are at rest theodorus to be sure socrates and if they are to be in motion and nothing is to be devoid of motion all things must always have every sort of motion theodorus most true socrates consider a further point did we not understand them to explain the generation of heat whiteness or anything else in some such manner as the following were they not saying that each of them is moving between the agent and the patient together with a perception and that the patient ceases to be a perceiving power and becomes a percipient and the agent a quality instead of a quality i suspect that quality may appear a strange and uncouth term to you and that you do not understand the abstract expression then i will take concrete instances i mean to say that the producing power or agent becomes neither heat nor whiteness but hot and white and the like of other things for i must repeat what i said before that neither the agent nor patient have any absolute existence but when they come together and generate sensations and their objects the one becomes a thing of a certain quality and the other a percipient you remember theodorus of course socrates we may leave the details of their theory unexamined but we must not forget to ask them the only question with which we are concerned are all things in motion and flux theodorus yes they will reply socrates and they are moved in both those ways which we distinguished that is to say they move in place and are also changed theodorus of course if the motion is to be perfect socrates if they only moved in place and were not changed we should be able to say what is the nature of the things which are in motion and flux theodorus exactly socrates but now since not even white continues to flow white and whiteness itself is a flux or change which is passing into another colour and is never to be caught standing still can the name of any colour be rightly used at all theodorus how is that possible socrates either in the case of this or of any other quality if while we are using the word the object is escaping in the flux socrates and what would you say of perceptions such as sight and hearing or any other kind of perception is there any stopping in the act of seeing and hearing theodorus certainly not if all things are in motion socrates then we must not speak of seeing any more than of not seeing nor of any other perception more than of any non-perception if all things partake of every kind of motion theodorus certainly not socrates yet perception is knowledge so at least theaetetus and i were saying theodorus very true socrates then when we were asked what is knowledge we no more answered what is knowledge than what is not knowledge theodorus i suppose not socrates here then is a fine result we corrected our first answer in our eagerness to prove that nothing is at rest but if nothing is at rest every answer upon whatever subject is equally right you may say that a thing is or is not thus or if you prefer becomes thus and if we say becomes we shall not then hamper them with words expressive of rest theodorus quite true socrates yes theodorus except in saying thus and not thus but you ought not to use the word thus for there is no motion in thus or in not thus the maintainers of the doctrine have as yet no words in which to express themselves and must get a new language i know of no word that will suit them except perhaps no how which is perfectly indefinite theodorus yes 
that is a manner of speaking in which they will be quite at home socrates and so theodorus we have got rid of your friend without assenting to his doctrine that every man is the measure of all things a wise man only is a measure neither can we allow that knowledge is perception certainly not on the hypothesis of a perpetual flux unless perchance our friend theaetetus is able to convince us that it is theodorus very good socrates and now that the argument about the doctrine of protagoras has been completed i am absolved from answering for this was the agreement theaetetus not theodorus until you and socrates have discussed the doctrine of those who say that all things are at rest as you were proposing theodorus you theaetetus who are a young rogue must not instigate your elders to a breach of faith but should prepare to answer socrates in the remainder of the argument theaetetus yes if he wishes but i would rather have heard about the doctrine of rest theodorus invite socrates to an argument invite horsemen to the open plain do but ask him and he will answer socrates nevertheless theodorus i am afraid that i shall not be able to comply with the request of theaetetus theodorus not comply for what reason socrates my reason is that i have a kind of reverence not so much for melissos and the others who say that all is one and at rest as for the great leader himself parmenides venerable and awful as in homeric language he may be called him i should be ashamed to approach in a spirit unworthy of him i met him when he was an old man and i was a mere youth and he appeared to me to have a glorious depth of mind and i am afraid that we may not understand his words and may be still further from understanding his meaning above all i fear that the nature of knowledge which is the main subject of our discussion may be thrust out of sight by the unbidden guests who will come pouring in upon our feast of discourse if we let them in besides the question which is now stirring is of immense extent and will be treated unfairly if only considered by the way or if treated adequately and at length will put into the shade the other question of knowledge neither the one nor the other can be allowed but i must try by my art of midwifery to deliver theaetetus of his conceptions about knowledge theaetetus very well do so if you will socrates then now theaetetus take another view of the subject you answered that knowledge is perception theaetetus i did socrates and if any one were to ask you with what does a man see black and white colours and with what does he hear high and low sounds you would say if i am not mistaken with the eyes and with the ears theaetetus i should socrates the free use of words and phrases rather than minute precision is generally characteristic of a liberal education and the opposite is pedantic but sometimes precision is necessary and i believe that the answer which you have just given is open to the charge of incorrectness for which is more correct to say that we see or hear with the eyes and with the ears or through the eyes and through the ears theaetetus i should say through socrates rather than with socrates yes my boy for no one can suppose that in each of us as in a sort of trojan horse there are perched a number of unconnected senses which do not all meet in some one nature the mind or whatever we please to call it of which they are the instruments and with which through them we perceive objects of sense theaetetus i agree with you in that opinion socrates the reason why i am thus precise is because i want to know whether when we perceive black and white through the eyes and again other qualities through other organs we do not perceive them with one and the same part of ourselves and if you were asked you might refer all such perceptions to the body perhaps however i had better allow you to answer for yourself and not interfere tell me then are not the organs through which you perceive warm and hard and light and sweet organs of the body theaetetus of the body certainly socrates and you would admit that what you perceive through one faculty you cannot perceive through another 
the objects of hearing for example cannot be perceived through sight or the objects of sight through hearing theaetetus of course not socrates if you have any thought about both of them this common perception cannot come to you either through the one or the other organ theaetetus it cannot socrates how about sounds and colors in the first place you would admit that they both exist theaetetus yes socrates and that either of them is different from the other and the same with itself theaetetus certainly socrates and that both are two and each of them one theaetetus yes socrates you can further observe whether they are like or unlike one another theaetetus i dare say socrates but through what do you perceive all this about them for neither through hearing nor yet through seeing can you apprehend that which they have in common let me give you an illustration of the point at issue if there were any meaning in asking whether sounds and colours are saline or not you would be able to tell me what faculty would consider the question it would not be sight or hearing but some other theaetetus certainly the faculty of taste socrates very good and now tell me what is the power which discerns not only in sensible objects but in all things universal notions such as those which are called being and not being and those others about which we were just asking what organs will you assign for the perception of these notions theaetetus you are thinking of being and not being likeness and unlikeness sameness and difference and also of unity and other numbers which are applied to objects of sense and you mean to ask through what bodily organ the soul perceives odd and even numbers and other arithmetical conceptions socrates you follow me excellently theaetetus that is precisely what i am asking theaetetus indeed socrates i cannot answer my only notion is that these unlike objects of sense have no separate organ but that the mind by a power of her own contemplates the universals in all things socrates you are beauty theaetetus and not ugly as theodorus was saying for he who utters the beautiful is himself beautiful and good and besides being beautiful you have done me a kindness in releasing me from a very long discussion if you are clear that the soul views some things by herself and others through the bodily organs for that was my own opinion and i wanted you to agree with me theaetetus i am quite clear socrates and to which class would you refer being or essence for this of all our notions is the most universal theaetetus i should say to that class which the soul aspires to know of herself socrates and would you say this also of like and unlike same and other theaetetus yes socrates and would you say the same of the noble and base and of good and evil theaetetus these i conceive to be notions which are essentially relative and which the soul also perceives by comparing in herself things past and present with the future socrates and does she not perceive the hardness of that which is hard by the touch and the softness of that which is soft equally by the touch theaetetus yes socrates but their essence and what they are and their opposition to one another and the essential nature of this opposition the soul herself endeavours to decide for us by the review and comparison of them theaetetus certainly socrates the simple sensations which reach the soul through the body are given at birth to men and animals by nature but their reflections on the being and use of them are slowly and hardly gained if they are ever gained by education and long experience theaetetus assuredly socrates and can a man attain truth who fails of attaining being theaetetus impossible socrates and can he who misses the truth of anything have a knowledge of that thing theaetetus he cannot socrates then knowledge does not consist in impressions of sense but in reasoning about them in that only and not in the mere impression truth and being can be attained theaetetus clearly 
Socrates. And would you call the two processes by the same name, when there is so great a difference between them? Theaetetus. That would certainly not be right. Socrates. And what name would you give to seeing, hearing, smelling, being cold, and being hot? Theaetetus. I should call all of them perceiving. What other name could be given to them? Socrates. Perception would be the collective name of them? Theaetetus. Certainly. Socrates. Which, as we say, has no part in the attainment of truth any more than of being? Theaetetus. Certainly not. Socrates. And therefore not in science or knowledge? Theaetetus. No. Socrates. Then perception, Theaetetus, can never be the same as knowledge or science? Theaetetus. Clearly not, Socrates, and knowledge has now been most distinctly proved to be different from perception. Socrates. But the original aim of our discussion was to find out, rather, what knowledge is than what it is not. At the same time, we have made some progress, for we no longer seek for knowledge in perception at all. But in that other process, however called, in which the mind is alone and engaged with being. Theaetetus. You mean, Socrates, if I am not mistaken, what is called thinking or opining? Socrates. You conceive truly. And now, my friend, please to begin again at this point, and, having wiped out of your memory all that has preceded, see if you have arrived at any clearer view, and once more say what is knowledge. Theaetetus. I cannot say, Socrates, that all opinion is knowledge, because there may be a false opinion, but I will venture to assert that knowledge is true opinion. Let this, then, be my reply, and, if this is hereafter disproved, I must try to find another. Socrates. That is the way in which you ought to answer, Theaetetus, and not in your former hesitating strain. For if we are bold, we shall gain one of two advantages. Either we shall find what we seek, or we shall be less likely to think that we know what we do not know. In either case, we shall be richly rewarded. And now, what are you saying? Are there two sorts of opinion, one true and the other false? And do you define knowledge to be the true? Theaetetus. Yes, according to my present view. Socrates. Is it still worth our while to resume the discussion touching opinion? Theaetetus. To what are you alluding? Socrates. There is a point which often troubles me, and is a great perplexity to me, both in regard to myself and others. I cannot make out the nature or origin of the mental experience to which I refer. Theaetetus. Pray, what is it? Socrates. How there can be false opinion. That difficulty still troubles the eye of my mind, and I am uncertain whether I shall leave the question, or begin over again in a new way. Theaetetus. Begin again, Socrates, at least, if you think that there is the slightest necessity for doing so. Were not you and Theodorus just now remarking very truly that in discussions of this kind we may take our own time? Socrates. You are quite right, and perhaps there will be no harm in retracing our steps and beginning again. Better a little which is well done than a great deal imperfectly. Theaetetus. Certainly. End of part three of Theaetetus. Recording in memory of Mitchell Edwards.